A large and multifaceted work, like Cartography and the European Enlightenment, Volume 4 of the History of Cartography series, looks at maps and mapping from many perspectives. Consider the world map. How did Europeans map the world in the 18th century? Many of the volume's 207 contributors touch upon the subject. From the volume introduction, in which editors Matthew Edney and Mary Pedley reproduce a world map as the volume's very first image, to the volume's dedicated entry on the subject by Jeff Armitage. The volume includes other directly related entries, such as projections used for geographical maps by Joel Morrison and Michael Wintel, and Meridians Local and Prime by Matthew Edney. World maps illustrate many more entries. Overall, about 30 of the 954 illustrations in the book are world maps, and this number does not include the volume's many reproductions of globes and images of world maps found in portraits or domestic scenes. What does this profusion of material tell us about how and why Europeans mapped the world between 1650 and 1800? It is commonly believed that Gerhard Mercator's famous projection was ubiquitous in European world mapping after its introduction in 1569, but cartography in the European Enlightenment proves otherwise. The great majority of European world maps were instead constructed in two hemispheres on the stereographic projection, which preserves angles and shapes. By dividing the world into two, map makers prevented the excessive distortion of areas, and the circularity of the hemispheres suggested the Earth's sphericity. While some map makers left their world maps rather plain, others took advantage of the spandrels, the spaces left between the rectangular edge of the paper and the circles of the hemispheres. These spaces offered room for further information and illustration, astronomical depictions of the heavens or allegories of the elements, the seasons, and the continents. Such embellishments and decoration persisted until the end of the century on many world maps intended for general audiences, such as this map published in Lyon in 1795. In its basic form, the double hemisphere world map depicted the Americas in one hemisphere and Europe, Africa, and Asia in the other. A few geographers played with this by using an oblique aspect and centering a hemisphere on Western Europe. This resulted in one hemisphere dominated by land and the other dominated by water. A number of such maps were made, highlighting the physical division between the terrestrial and the marine, and also making political statements by centering the land hemisphere on a given nation's capital city. So what about Mercator's projection? Volume 4 reveals that although Mercator had designed the projection for the use of mariners, it was rarely used for marine charts before 1800. In reality, it was used in two very specific ways for world maps. First, geographers used Mercator's projection when mapping the global distribution of physical and social phenomena because it shows the Earth's surface in a continuous and uninterrupted manner, as can be seen, for example, in Jacques Nicolas Berlin's 1765 map of magnetic variation. Second, a few geographers used the projection, with its marine connotations, to map Europe's maritime empires as they steadily embraced the world. World maps are just one small subset of the many maps, in all shapes, sizes, colors, and formats, and designed for different reasons, that Europeans produced during the Enlightenment. You can find out more about them in Cartography in the European Enlightenment, available in university libraries or from the University of Chicago Press for your own bookshelf. And please consider supporting the History of Cartography project as we work to complete the final volume in the series, Cartography in the 19th Century, so you can learn the next chapter in the history of the world map. Thanks for watching.